If you like data and you like that little cha-ching sound, then this is the video for you. I'm going to go through all of my eBooks published since 2016, which is when I started self-publishing and see how much each book has made since then. I'm Lydia Foxglove and I'm a fantasy author. I started in traditional publishing in 2009 and moved into self-publishing in 2016. I've been full-time for most of those years and I've had a number of requests for a video about how much each book has made over the years. So let's get into it. For starters, it would probably be ideal if I had put this all on like a spreadsheet or something that I could flash up on the screen, but I really am a notebook girl. So I wrote it all down down in my notebook. I'm sorry. I also want to note that this is only my Amazon sales. I did take my books wide onto the other retailers, which is Apple, Google, Kobo, Barnes Noble, plus some other like library distribution and so on. I started taking my books wide. I want to say it was around the beginning of 2021. I haven't made a massive amount of money on the other retailers and their reporting is just not as good as Amazon. I have a lot of complaints about Amazon, but I can at least say that their reporting for your lifetime sales or sales per book, etc., is much better than any of the other retailers. Since they're the bulk of my sales anyway, that is the only part that I'm going to report on today. I also have a number of books in audiobook. One of them I paid for upfront myself. That was Beauty and the Goblin King. And then I have the Cursed Soul trilogy, Guardians of Sky and Shadow, A Witch Among Warlocks, and Paranormal House Flippers were all purchased by Tantor and made into audiobooks by them. Most of them have earned out and I do get royalties on them. It usually ends up being I want to say about $1,600 per year, while the one that I paid for still hasn't made back the $1,200, I want to say, that I spent on it. Part of this might be because I put the audiobook out way after the initial release of the book. Either way, that hasn't really been very beneficial for me. So those are kind of other revenue streams, but we're mainly going to be looking at ebook sales as well as Kindle Unlimited page reads revenue on Amazon over time. Again, I did not break them down by ebooks and page revenue because there's only so much data you can fit into one video. But I did pull out my two best performing books and noted how much they each made respectively. But we'll get to that. So my indie publishing career started in April of 2016. I had a book. It was a young adult novel. I was hoping that it would be my next novel to sell to a traditional publisher through my agent. However, my agent didn't really love the book she didn't really want to send it out. I told her, well, I love this book so much. I want to give it a try. I had a great relationship with my agent, really. She was wonderful, but I just was really attached to this book. I wanted to give it a fair shake. So I sent it out to agents. None of them took it on either. And then I decided I'm going to self-publish it. I did not know what I was doing whatsoever. So this book, The Vengeful Half, came out in April of 2016, and it has made to date $476. Another thing I wanted to note, you have to factor in advertising costs and the cost of producing the book, like the cover. So I'm giving you the raw numbers here. You have to subtract a pretty large chunk for advertising costs. I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the video. So even though The Vengeful Half did so poorly, I had already started working on the sequel, The Stolen Heart. So in June, I released The Stolen Heart. I had also heard that book sales start to pick up when you release the second book in the series and the final book in the series, but that did not end up being my experience. The Stolen Heart made $129. And at this point, the sales of The Vengeful Half were starting to drop off. It was clear that this was not going to be a career path for me. At this time, I was waiting for my final advance for my last traditionally published book, which was going to be about $30,000. I was also selling postcards on eBay to stretch out my money, like vintage postcards. So this was a serious low point in my career. I was quite desperate financially, and this was when, for the first time, I seriously started looking into indie published romance. 
I read a few of the fantasy romance that were on the charts at the time, and then I tried to write my own without having a really great grasp of the romance genre. But around June or July of 2016, I published The Sorcerer's Concubine. This was a series that was set in my beloved fantasy world, but I had come up with sort of a setup for it that sounded like a romance because I had been seeing that a lot of them were about, you know, forced proximity, forced marriages, and then the couple has to wrangle with that. This was about a girl named Velsa who is an artificial sort of living doll girl who has been created to be a concubine that will be bought by a man but instead she's bought by a sorcerer and he's kind of nice. When people ask me what book to start with when reading my books this is one of the ones that I recommend the most because it's very me, it's set in my main fantasy world, and I loved writing it. This did actually end up being one of my most successful books. To date it has made $29,357. I remember the first day that this book cracked $100 a day which is kind of what I needed to live on and I was just so excited. I was supposed to go antiquing with a friend. I was feeling so good because it was the first time that I had ever been able to afford my life writing something that I truly loved. Obviously, I immediately got to work on the next book in the series, The Sorcerer's Wife, and in October, I came out with that one. The Sorcerer's Wife today has made $11,615. Obviously, there can be a big drop-off between book one and two, which I have seen with most of my books. Part of that might be that I don't really write the tropes the way you're supposed to, so I get a lot of drop-off as people are disappointed that the book wasn't executed in the most standard way. That is my best guess anyway. Nevertheless, when you release the second book in a series, if the series is doing fairly well, it does usually bolster series of book one. So even though book two made a lot less, it still brought up the sales of book one. So I was still doing better than when I just had one book out. So 2016 in total, I released four books. As of the middle of the year, I started making like enough money to scrape by. Then we get to 2017. In January, I released the final book in that series, The Sorcerer's Equal. To date, that one has made $5,983. I was still doing well because the release of book three was still getting book one to sell better, but pretty quickly things were starting to drop off again. I started working on a new series set in the world, and in April I released The Vampire's Doll, which was kind of a spin-off of one of the side characters in the Cursed Soul trilogy. However, whereas with The Sorcerer's Concubine, I had sort of stumbled into a proper execution of fantasy romance tropes for that time, The Vampire's Doll, I went back to my old ways of completely missing the mark in every way possible from the plot line to the cover. That book has made to date $1,217, of which I probably netted less than a thousand. Sales of the first trilogy were dropping off, so I was getting kind of panicked. Very hastily, I came up with my pen name and what that pen name would get up to which I decided should be steamy fairy tale retellings. I thought with steamy fairy tale retellings, for one thing, I actually really like steamy fairy tales and fairy tales in general. They would be fairly easy to write because they already have a plot framework. They could probably be fairly short, and the Beauty and the Beast live action movie had just come out and seemed to be giving a little bump to any Beauty and the Beast fairy tale retelling, so I thought this will at least pay my bills. That April I released my first book as Lydia Foxglove, Beauty and the Goblin King. This has been my most successful book to date. It still generally sells at least one copy every day. Day, even seven years later. To date has made $64,063. You can knock at least a third of that off for advertising. Nevertheless, it is an astonishing return for something that I wrote and edited in like two weeks, and I think the cover cost like $100, $200. I did very little advertising for beauty. I wasn't established. It was just kind of a pure luck thing in a lot of ways, but I was very happily surprised with how well it was selling. I got to work on the sequel right away. This was a retelling of the 12 dancing princesses called These Wicked Rebels. I released that in May, and to date, These Wicked Rebels has made $23,635. By this time, I also felt like I had learned more about indie publishing, and I still loved the first series I published, The Ventral Half and The Stolen Heart. I wanted to give them a second chance, being more to market, 
So I tried to rewrite them as an adult urban fantasy and re-released those two books as Fortune's Curse and, once again, The Stolen Heart. Fortune's Curse came out in June and it was still a huge flop. In fact, it was worse than The Vengeful Half. That one made $346, which I think I was actually in the hole by the time you factor the initial advertising and the cost of the cover. But never mind all that, the fairy tales were cranking along. In July, I released Rapunzel and the Dark Prince. To date, that one has made $23,806. It's actually made slightly more than these Wicked Revels, which is probably because it was a more known fairy tale. In August, I released The Beggar Princess, a retelling of King Thrushbeard at the beginning of the month and at the end of the month, The Goblin Cinderella. The Beggar Princess has made $17,901 and The Goblin Cinderella has made $15,000. $15,858. And a quick reminder that these totals are spread across seven or almost seven years. At the time, I was probably netting like $6,000 or something like that in these early months of the Fairy Tale Heat series. And I was absolutely thrilled. I had never made this kind of money in my life. I'm sure that's partly why I was writing much faster than I ever had before, because the fire was in me to achieve some kind of financial stability. I should also note that the Goblin Cinderella was offered as a free book for signing up for my mailing list for years. So the fact that it still made $15,858, only slightly less, well, like $2,000 less than the book before it, and in fact, $700-ish more than the book that came after it, it was pretty good. So next was The Mermaid Bride that came out in September and that has made $15,174. And then in October, Taste and Gretel, $13,546. In October, I also re-released The Stolen Heart. I don't actually know how much each release of that one made because Amazon lumps them together because they have the same title. So that one really made no money at that point, I gave up on that series and pulled it from sale. I also pretty much gave up on publishing under my real name because I was writing very steamy books and I was just following the market wherever it seemed to be going, no matter how much I didn't want to tell my family about it. <laughs> the one last gasp of my real name is that in December, I published Between the Sea and Sky. This was a young adult book that had been published by Bloomsbury, but it was no longer selling. I got the rights back, published the ebook myself. I didn't expect a whole lot from it, obviously, because it had already been around, but you might as well. And this book is one of my favorites. It is about a mermaid who has a childhood best friend who is a winged boy. They end up separating and re-meeting years later when he is running a bookstore and she has a spell that allows her to walk on land, but with caveats. That one has made to date $690. In these final months of 2017, there was a trend that was starting to take off on Amazon in a huge way, as in the most terrible book with like the cheapest looking cover and the sloppiest writing. Anything would sell in this genre. And this was Reverse Harem, which is when you have one girl and multiple guys, sort of a polyamorous genre, but it can range from kind of teen romance to very dark and steamy. And it had kind of come over from anime and fanfic and now it was all over Amazon. My closest writer friends were starting to write Reverse Harem. I wanted a little piece of that, especially since I loved anime and manga and I figured that some of that audience would be the readers for it. So I started working on a reverse harem called Priestess Awakened and in January of 2018, oops I forgot to recap 2017 real quick. 2017 I had 12 releases, nine of them were new books and three of them were re-releases of older work. Anyway, 2018, I released Priestess Awaken, which was kind of a high fantasy reverse harem that was kind of lighthearted and was a mashup of the Fushigi Yugi anime and Final Fantasy IV, but make it sexy. I also released one more fairy tale heat book, Taming Red Riding Hood. Both of those in the same month. Taming Red Riding Hood has made $10,410. Priestess Awakened has made $14,001. At the time, I should note, Priestess Awakened seemed like it was selling much better than Taming Red Riding Hood. So I was kind of done with fairy tale. However, over time, 
Taming Red Riding Hood has continued to sell much better than Priestess Awakened. So in the long run, it might have been better if I had just written fairy tales, but there's also only so long you can just keep writing fairy tales without a break. So I was having a lot of fun writing Priestess Awakened. In March, I released the sequel, Priestess Bound. That one has made $10,290. Pretty good read through, although it's also been given away free a lot, the first book. But some of my friends were doing paranormal reverse harem rather than high fantasy. So I started to think I need to do a paranormal if I really want to make the big money. So I started working on a little lighthearted paranormal reverse harem that introduced a paranormal world I would end up going back to many times. It was about a social media addicted girl who ends up going on an escape to a magical island with a magical house where technology doesn't work and there's some hot guys there. It was just a fun little book. Tempted by Demons came out in April of 2018 and has made $11,247 to date. And then in May, I released Priestess Unleashed, the final book in the Guardians of Sky and Shadow series, which has made $7,399. In June, I released a companion book to Tempted by Demons about one of the friends captured by dragons. That one has made $6,171. I had originally intended a third book in that series, but I started to think I need something that's a little bigger and more interconnected than just these very lighthearted books. They didn't seem to be where the trend was going at that time. I also started to think that maybe I needed to try something different with fairy tale heat. Maybe I should try a longer story. I wanted to try dipping my toe into dark romance. I thought that Sleeping Beauty would be a great book for this. Obviously there was Anne Rice's Sleeping Beauty trilogy, which I was always kind of disappointed that it really had almost nothing to do with the Sleeping Beauty story whatsoever. I also was on this huge Marie Antoinette kick. So I had this idea to combine Sleeping Beauty with Marie Antoinette and make it a dark romance. I should note that I did a ridiculous amount of research on Marie Antoinette for this book. The historical parts of it are very accurate, even though probably almost no one reading it cared about that part of it when you consider everything else that's going on in this story. But in July, I released Prisoner of Silk, the first book in this series. To date, that book has made $6,513. This was a book where I could see two different ways of trying to market it, and the way that I chose was not the right one. In August, I came out with the sequel to that, Prisoner of Mirrors. That one has made $3,614 to date really not doing great. So then I started working on a second trilogy set in the same world as the Guardians of Sky and Shadow. This was called Kingdoms of Sky and Shadow, and it got even deeper into some pretty serious fantasy. There was a lot of world building. There was a lot of very epic stuff going on. I was really indulging what I prefer to write. It's probably no surprise that this one didn't do fabulously. It was keeping me going. The first book in this series, The Glass Princess, has made $10,404. At the same time, to coincide with the release of The Glass Princess, I released a box set of the Guardians of Sky and Shadow series, and that box set has made $24,157 to date. So as you can see in this case, the box set really ended up being a large chunk of the earnings, almost as much as the original release made. Always very hard to say whether those books would have just continued to sell and make as much money or if releasing the box set was a good idea. I have never been able to find a good way to prove whether a box set is beneficial personally, so I've kind of been back and forth on them. In November, I released The Shadowed Crown. That was the sequel to The Glass Princess. That one has made $6,772. Also, these books were getting long, so these amounts were not seeming very great compared to how much fairy tale Heat had been making when these books were twice as long. In December, I released a box set of the first four Fairy Tale Heat books. That one I left up until February of 2021, so it was for sale for like two years and two months, and it made $7,298. 
but ultimately I kind of felt like it was stealing sales from Beauty and the Goblin King and the other books in the series and I felt like they were selling pretty well without the box set already so I ended up just pulling the box set and never redoing it again. So in 2018 I had 12 releases, 10 of them were new novels, two were box sets. Then we get to 2019 which ended up being a huge year for me. In January I released The Crystal Queen, the final book in the Kingdoms of Sky and Shadow series. That one has made $4,350. We weren't off to a really great start here, but I was working on my first more ambitious paranormal romance reverse harem series. I also had sort of neglected the Marie Antoinette Sleeping Beauty mashup, so I got that finished. I released book three, Prisoner of Dreams in March. That one has made $1,518. Pretty bad, but we're not done with that series. In March, in anticipation of this new paranormal reverse harem that I was writing, I wrote a novella that was in a like collection that various authors were doing. I want to say it was about 20,000 words and it was about the grandmother of the main character. That was timed out to release right around the time as the first book. At the time I didn't really make any money off of that or maybe there was a small payment for the anthology that I don't really remember but I later offered it as a freebie and I also simultaneously had it up for a 99 cent book which you can only get 35 cents in royalties on a 99 cent book. That one has still made $154.35 which not bad. And in March I released The Fairer Hex, the first series in A Witch Among Warlocks. This series was conceived as a mashup between between the Boys Over Flowers manga and Harry Potter, but of course make it a sexy reverse harem. It was kind of playful, but it also had some serious stuff. And I had it on pre-order for like three months beforehand. It was getting way more pre-orders than anything I'd ever put out before. Like I could feel that this book was going to end up being big and there was an academy trend that started to hit in reverse harem. Just around that time everybody suddenly started asking for academy reverse harem and I had already been working on the book so it was almost done and ready to drop right at that point when the interest for it built. So a lot of its success was due to pure luck. But nevertheless, I released it and to date it has made $40,945. In the long run, it's made substantially less than Beauty and the Goblin King, but it did give me my biggest single sales months that I've ever had. In my peak month when book two released, I made like $20,000 in one month, which was insane to me. <laughs> If I thought that the money I was making when I released Fairy Tale Heat at first was good, I could not fathom making $20,000 in one month because that was how much I made in an entire year for many years. And this was a crazy year in my life. We ended up kind of having to move hastily from Maryland to North Carolina. And in fact, this house came on the market that seemed really perfect and Fair Hex was on pre-order. So I didn't have the money to buy the house, but I knew that I was about to release this book. So I made an offer on the house with like the longest possible contingency thinking, well, if Fair Hex ends up bombing, I'm gonna have to pull out and lose a few hundred dollars but I think it's gonna do well and then I'll have the money to do this and it worked out so that was one of the most nerve-wracking years of my entire life and I had to keep writing books during all of this which the whole year was crazy like we had to do all these renovations on the house to make it accessible for my partner who has bad knees we were carrying two mortgages at once for many months and we had to pack everything very hastily so 2019 was complete chaos but I was making a lot of money. I hope the lighting isn't too modeled at this time of day. I got interrupted for a bit and now the light's kind of weird. In April of 2019 I released the sequel Boys Over Powers which has made $18,160 and then in July the third book A Fine Necromance which made $11,440. That same month July also released a box set of the Kingdoms of Sky and Shadow series which has made $7,905. $5. Again, not sure if the box set was beneficial or not. But then in August, I released the box set of the Marie Antoinette Sleeping Beauty story. I rebranded it 
in a big way, changed the series name to The Surrender of Sleeping Beauty, kind of riff off of the Anne Rice Sleeping Beauty. And this rebrand really worked. To date, that book has made $25,490, which makes it my fourth most successful release ever. And obviously it's three books, so that was a fair bit of work, but it's definitely my most successful box set and it definitely made up for the time that I spent writing it. That's the most successful rebrand that I've ever had. I ended up making the Witch Among Warlocks series four books because it was doing so well. So in September I released Battle of the Hexes, the final book. It has made $7,744. Huge drop off however from book one which has made $40,000, almost $41,000. So it was definitely time to pack it in with that series and it also there were a lot of Academy Reverse Harem on the market at this point so mine was no longer like the hot thing. But I still felt like it had gone well enough that I wanted to continue in that world. One of the things about Reverse Harem is that you have to come up with a lot of main characters for every series and if you have to come up with a whole other fantasy world every time at the same time that is a lot to come up with and these books were not very formulaic. They had a decent amount of like world building and a lot of characters. These were not like the easiest books to do as a fast release. So anything that I could kind of reuse or any world building work that had already been done definitely helped me. So I took one of the characters from that series, Daisy. She was one of my favorites. A little bit of a diva, witch from Chicago, just a really fun character. And I released the first book in her series, Face Worn. It has made $9,993 dollars almost that 10,000 mark and in December I released the second book in that series Faye Tempted which has made $4,559. I do kind of like to come up with the next thing and release it before all the momentum from the previous series has died down so I often tend to release like a new book one before I wrap up the previous series or at least at this time when I was releasing so quickly. But anyway 2019 I had 11 releases of which there were eight novels novels, one novella, and one box set or two box sets. So January of 2020 kicked off with the first release that was another kind of spinoff from Witch Among Warlocks but whereas Face Worn was very lighthearted and funny I decided I would also try one that was like dark. This was probably not the best idea because I wasn't really known for dark except for the Sleeping Beauty trilogy which was a very different genre and probably marketed to a different audience. But I get bored easily so I went dark and I did this vampire series about a witch girl who has grown up in like a witch cult but she is the reincarnation of a girl that this vampire has been looking for because she is his initial love and she can't be turned into a vampire so the only way that he can find her is to find her reincarnation. If you watch my video about writing the broken queen you can see that I kind of grabbed this reincarnation idea from my pre-existing world which also has some repeated reincarnation. So Take Me Slowly came out in January. It has made $13,126. Then in February I wrapped up Daisy's story with Feybound. That one made $4,375. And then in April I released Love Me Madly, which was the second vampire book, and that one made $3,981. So as you can see, that series was starting to drop off a lot, and I think that a lot of people probably weren't happy with the dark tone of the first book, especially because the main guy is kind of a jerk in the first book, which is not what I usually write. So I think I turned off some of my audience, even though that is popular in other books by other authors. It wasn't really what I I was known for. I also released A Witch Among Warlocks as a box set in April. That one has made $15,847. Not bad. Now there was something going on in April of 2020 that made the entire world depressed and I was in the middle of this dark and rather depressing, well I don't want to say depressing, but the vampire book is intense. It has some parts that I really love. I'm actually very proud of that story. The way that it really comes together, it made me cry a little bit while I was writing it and I was very happy with the emotional arcs ultimately. But it was not a book to be writing at the beginning of the pandemic. So since the vampire book wasn't doing very well and I was getting depressed writing it, I felt like I need to write something lighthearted and fun again. I didn't know that 
the world was going to get so depressing. So I started working on the Paranormal House Flipper series, which was an idea that just kind of sprung to mind. And as soon as it did, I was like, yeah, that's going to be a blast. I was watching a lot of House Hunters and those house flipping shows at this point. It seems like a real pandemic era activity. <laughs> So in May, I released Demons in the Bedroom about a witch named Helena who comes from a very wealthy family, but she wants to branch out on her own and she loves flipping the houses of witches and finding the magical secrets that are inside. This book was super fun. It's gotten some of my best reviews and it has made $18,885. And I was having so much fun with the series that I released the next one in June. That one made $12,214. That was Wolves at the Door. And then the very next month, in July, I released the final book, Phantom of the Library, which made $9,186. So that series just kind of poured out. It was kind of my peak pandemic escape. But the vampire book was still hovering over me. I really wanted to wrap it up. I really wanted to do these characters justice, even though I wasn't sure it would make very much money. So I buckled down and I finished that. Kill Me Softly came out in September. That one has made $2,000 $2,066. Mm. I wanted to go back to something lighthearted, so I took one of the side characters from the Paranormal House Flippers story and gave him his own story, but the main character was actually a girl who was a familiar, and the familiars in this world can take either a human or an animal form, and they're bound to serve their witch or warlock, but there are a few of them that aren't super happy with this arrangement or the warlock or witch doesn't treat them that well. The main character was in this category. And this was a fairly like lighthearted kind of rompy series where she finds her harem of men who are all kind of villains in a way, but they're kind of a little bit humorous. It seemed like there was a bit of a trend toward like funnier, sweeter books at this time. So I was hoping that this would hit that spot, <laughs> but... That first book, Sympathy for the Demons, came out in November and it has made to date $3,625. Now something I want to note about planning the costs of a series is that when I would release the first book, particularly at this time because the main advertising I used was Amazon ads, I would spend a lot of money in the beginning to push the book and get it like kind of in the algorithm. And then I would hope that I would make money on it later. So often I was losing money in the first month, which means that like very roughly, if a book makes $6,000 for book one, $3,000 that's probably going straight back to advertising. And then if you think half the audience has dropped off for books two and three, you're not paying for advertising and you're maybe getting $3,000 a book for those, something like that. So really the minimum I want a book one to make is $6,000. And even then that's kind of dicey because it often takes a little more than a month, maybe two months to write a book. So then you're netting about maybe $8,000 for you know five months of work. And then I'm also not factoring the cost of the covers, which could easily run you up to $1,200 at most, or maybe even more if your budget is higher. So needless to say, Sympathy for the Demons making only $3,600 was not a good performance at all. In December, I released a box set of Daisy's story. I rebranded it. I made it look more kind of like this really fun, bright reality show vibe. Although ultimately, well, I wasn't really happy with how it turned out. And this box set also did not do well. But that one came out and has only made $1,812. That's a book in some ways I would still love to rebrand, except I don't really do reverse harem anymore. But I love that story. I kept up with the story of the familiar girl. I released the second book in December bat out of hell. That one has made $1,315. Definitely a big drop off from book one. That was not going well. I also released a box set of the vampire story and that one I also tried to do rebrand to make it look a little like traditionally vampire-y. I was worried that the original covers Maybe the color palette didn't convey vampire enough. That one has made $4,190. So more than double what the Daisy box at Rebrand did. So that wraps up 2020. I had nine novels and a total of 12 releases, three of which were box sets. So then things get a little more 
difficult in 2021. Since the book about the familiar girl was really tanking, I tried to come up with something that would excite me and would also be to market. So I thought, I'm just gonna go traditional. It takes place in our world. It has shifters, because shifters are always popular. The main character is going to be a girl who can, you know, definitely hold her own and have good banter with the main guy. There's gonna be a little bit of an enemies to lovers thing going on. Basically, I tried to load it with popular tropes, but I also had pulled the characters from my main fantasy world and just like severely reworked them because I felt like that was the part that was going to keep me excited. Just feeling somewhat like I was writing about my real characters that I miss very much at this point because for years I had not had time to write about them. The last book that I had written about those characters was the rewrite of Fortune's Curse and A Stolen Heart, which had done so badly. And that was back in 2017. And here we are in 2021. This whole time I had gotten detached from the fantasy world and the characters that I love so much. So I tried to kind of rework them all into something very marketable. Some of them didn't really survive the transition while others seemed fairly like themselves. But either way, I was having fun with this series again, and I was very excited about it. I did a big push on social media more than I usually do. So that first book came out in February. It was called Black Queen Stray. I also invested a lot of money in these covers, like more than I ever had before. And Black Queen Stray to date has made $3,865. Only $40 more than the familiar book terrible, especially since I had planned the series to be nine books long. I was that confident that I had included really popular elements and that I'd gotten really good covers. So there's a lesson for you that sometimes, who, who knows? I wrapped up the familiar story with The Devil Went Down to Florida in March. That book has made $835. Also in March, I released the second book in the Shifter series, Black Queen Shadow. That one has made $1,969. In April, I released the third book, Black Queen Sovereign, $1,283. And in May, the fourth book in the series, White Queen Fiend, which has made, brace yourself, $766. So at this point, as you might imagine, I had had many series that are making generally like five figures for at least the first book in the series, if not the entire series. Suddenly I have these series that are barely clearing a profit of $2,000 and I've had two in a row like this that have just done very poorly. This was just a terrible year for me, and it was coming off a few really great years, and we were kind of still in the pandemic. It was just very depressing. So I knew that I was gonna have to make some difficult decisions at this point. The first thing I did was work on a new book in the Fairy Tale Heat series. I hadn't released one since January of 2018, but they had continued to sell the entire time. And that was one thing that I just didn't know in the beginning is that Fairy Tale Heat would keep selling and selling and selling, whereas the reverse harem would have like a big pop when they came out and then they would drop off almost immediately. So I thought it was worth writing another fairy tale. I'd also had a very long break from fairy tales, so I was ready to get back into it. So I wrote Captain Hook and the Mermaid. That one has made $6,204, so much better than what I had been doing, especially since re-releasing another fairy tale helped the sales of the previous eight books in the series, and that really kind of saved me that year. I still kept giving the Shifter series more time to pick up traction, and I released White Queen Flight in July. That book has made $542, and at this point, with great sadness, I had to pull the plug on the whole series. I just had to stop writing it. At this time, I still thought I'm gonna get back to it. Maybe I can wrap it up in like one book, but this, the plot that I had planned, it was very difficult to think how I could do that, and I was really struggling with it and avoiding it. Ultimately, Ultimately, I ended up just pulling those books from sale so that people would stop discovering them and occasionally I'd get an email asking me where more of them were and I'd feel so terrible and so depressed because I truly wanted to write this series, but you know. So I just got back to fairy tales because I needed money and fairy tales were doing it for me. So in August, I released The Giant's Captive, which was a Jack and the Beanstalk kind of gender flip. I think the cover of this one really had kind of a, you know, 
good steamy fairy tale vibe. This one did quite well, $7,924, which is great for a book 10 in a series. It was much better than Captain Hook and the Mermaid even, which was not a slouch itself. And the success of that one really boosted the whole fairy tale heat series. Also in September, I decided I was gonna re-release The Sorcerer's Concubine, which had originally come out under my own name. I was gonna re-release it as Lydia Foxglove because it was an adult fantasy romance. That got a little sexy at times. I thought that my readers would probably like it, at least some of them. I ended up rewriting it a decent amount because I had learned so much about romance at this point. I didn't want to compromise the book. It was part of my true fantasy world, so I didn't want to do anything to make it so that it wouldn't fit in with the world as a whole. But nevertheless, there were things I felt I could improve. So I rewrote it, re-released it in September. I don't know how much it's made because again, Amazon doesn't separate out the amounts when you re-release a book. I know it didn't make a ton of money, but it also was not like writing a whole new book from scratch. In October, I did another fairy tale, Bluebeard's Curse. That one has made $3,611. In November, I re-released The Sorcerer's Wife. Again, I don't know how much, but it was, you know, a little bump. In December, I did The Goblin's Price, which was a Rumpelstiltskin retelling. That one was $3,487. Again, these are not terrible totals for how late in the series they are, because a lot of times you're getting people to pick up every book previously. But at the end of 2021, I was definitely very unsure as to what to do, because I didn't just want to write fairy tales, and they also weren't making, like, big money. They were just making, like, hang in there money, and I would have to keep just doing fairy tales every month. There's only so many fairy tales out there and only so long I can just only write fairy tales. So I knew I needed a series that would do well, but I was really doubting myself because I'd had two in a row that I really thought were hitting the market and they did not. I left Reverse Harem behind. It felt like it was no longer a genre that I really had my finger on the pulse of and I thought I'm just gonna go back to just standard man and woman. <laughs> And I started working on a paranormal monster series that was set in the same fairy world that was in Daisy's story. In fact, Daisy appears in the beginning. I wrote a little bit of that. And then in January, my father-in-law died and everything got thrown into upheaval. I pretty much stopped writing entirely because we were selling off the contents of his estate, which was a ton of stuff and a ton of work. I had two books on pre-order and I pushed them back as far as possible, but those were the only books I wrote because I just didn't want to not deliver on these pre-orders. So in 2022, I only had two releases. In May, I had Wed to the Troll King, which was a retelling of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. That one has made $4,051. And then in June, I re-released The Sorcerer's Equal, which, you know, just made a smidge. And that was it. After not really writing for months, I started to just have like an absolutely burning desire to write something. And I really just wanted to write something for myself at this point. And the cozy romances, as well as like paranormal rom-coms were both kind of becoming big at this time. I just thought I really want to do one of those. So I wrote Doll Girl Meets Dead Guy. And this book was really for me. It kind of had that cozy, cute goth vibe that I've mentioned before, and it had characters that I had already written about in previous books, but it stands on its own. It's just a very cute and earnest and heartfelt love story slash coming of age story. That one came out in January of 2023 and I really had a hard time marketing this. I was very preoccupied obviously with my father-in-law's stuff. I wasn't sure if I should market it as a cozy fantasy or if I should market it as a paranormal rom-com. I kind of failed at both of those things. So as Doll Girl, it's made $878. I also briefly tried changing the title to A Taste of Magic and changing the cover. Under that title, it made $317. Basically a flop, but I still adore this book. I also didn't really need money at that particular point because we were selling off all my father-in-law's stuff. So that one was for me. Then in June, I released Rescued by the Raven King. I had a hard time writing that one because I was also still mired in this other work, but I wanted to keep something out there. I didn't want to go a whole year without like a fairy tale or something that my readers would get excited about. So that one has made $1,494. Not great, but I didn't really market it. I just kind of wrote it in. So that's basically the end of what I have released. 
2021 was, did I cover these years? 2021 was 12 releases of which 10 were new. 2022 was one new release and 2023 was two new releases. All in all, over the course of my whole career, I've written 58 books that have been published, even though some of them have been pulled. Am I counting that right? 58 books. And now I have an upcoming one, The Broken Queen. So I'm not going to get too deep into what I'm doing now and what my new strategy is because I've already talked about it in my first video, but there's an overview of my entire indie career to date and we'll see where things go from here. Hopefully I covered everything. It was probably pretty long. Oh yeah, I also was going to briefly just have a little note about wide releases and Amazon sales. Well, it's really more about Amazon ebook sales versus Kindle Unlimited sales. So if you have a book that's really long and you're getting page reads for it, you'll get a pretty high rate in Kindle Unlimited, which is Amazon subscription service. But if you have a shorter book, you don't get a whole lot from Kindle Unlimited. 40,000 words usually ends up being like a dollar, I wanna say. So the fairy tales are all about 40,000 words. If someone reads them, I get paid a dollar. If someone buys them, I get paid like $2.70. So Beauty, over the course of its lifetime, has made $31,469 on eBooks and $30,819 in Kindle Unlimited. They're pretty close, so obviously a lot more people borrowed the book than bought it. However, I started making a little more money with those when I took them wide and stopped offering them as a subscription because obviously you don't even have the numbers here for the ebook sales from the other retailers so you can add some more to that whereas Fairer Hex is a bit of a longer book and Reverse Harem readers are very heavy in Kindle Unlimited so that one has made $8,686 in ebooks and $32,000 in Kindle Unlimited page reads. Huge difference there. That's what, four times as much revenue in Kindle Unlimited as I got for ebook sales. So if I could go back in time, would I have taken those books wide? I'm not sure if it was a great idea. It's hard to say because they had dropped off a lot and they weren't really selling that much on Amazon anyway, but then it's not like they sold super great wide either. Those can be kind of difficult decisions to make, but ultimately part of the reason that I left Amazon Kindle Unlimited exclusivity is simply because Amazon's policies were just making me feel kind of, mm, don't like that. I will talk more extensively about that decision in a future video because I know some people are gonna ask. Anyway. I think that's it. I hope I covered everything, but that's what the comments are for if you have any questions. And I also have a Substack and a Patreon that have a free weekly Q&A as well as more in-depth writing stuff and behind the scenes of my books and a Discord if you join the $5 tier. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. I talk about the creative life in general and writing fantasy and world building in particular, both the practical and the emotional side, along with sometimes just some nerdy stuff. And I'll see you next time. Bye. The sunlight is kind of weird and patchy at this time of day, but there is a cat here and I don't want to lift the curtain up from under her and disturb her because she's very cute.